So thank you very much, um, and uh, good morning to, uh, to all of you. Um, I also would like to thank the organizers for um, um, yeah, setting this uh, impressive conference up uh, for such a hot topic uh, and for giving me the opportunity to, um, to speak here. Um, and uh, I will indeed try to bring some more light in this obscurity uh, uh, in this uh, area of law which we, which we uh, just heard. So I'm delighted to, to be able to address you. Um, Maybe a few words. I'm the deputy head of unit of the um, industrial property unit in the European Commission. I have a background more as a competition lawyer when I started my career. And then um, uh, when I moved to the commission in 2001, started in the competition field, but then like in 2008 came to uh, internal market and uh, uh, industrial property. Um, now, I'm very happy and delighted to, to discuss with you today although I know I have a very difficult task for two reasons. Because first, um, there is a long list of very distinguished speakers who are going to speak after me, so uh, I will have really a hard time to come up with very original uh, things here. But secondly also, and there I will be very honest with you, I know that the product I'm going to present to you, the patent package, is not a Ferrari. It's not the best, the most sleek, the most straightforward uh, system that we could think of. But it's not a shabby, rusty bicycle either. It's more like a prototype, which is a, a huge step forward if you look on where we're coming from, and uh, which is starting to roll and which we can make rolling. Um, at least this is uh, our strong conviction here at the, uh, at the level of the Commission. Um, and I think I fully agree um, with uh, the Chairman that we, we have to take this opportunity to, to ask a number of questions, um, and we will come across several questions throughout this talk. But I think, in particular, us as lawyers, um, our task, in my view, is to ask the questions, but you also to come up with answers. With answers who can make uh, this prototype work uh, for the benefit of uh, those who uh, are actually the target of this initiative. Because um, before we enter into the details, just a few words. Why are we actually uh, looking into a patent project for Europe and with such a long history and energy? Um, it's not a goal in itself. It's because um, we believe that uh, innovative industries matter for the single market and um, they matter for the European economy because innovation provides um, a competitive edge which is more stable than many other features, um, can contribute to growth and also is providing high quality jobs. And I will come back to, to these three points at the end because these are not just statements, um, but we now have very clear evidence that this is the case. Um, and against this background, the question that was put already a long time ago was, is actually the sort of toolbox that we uh, um, provide for European companies and innovators, is it actually complete? Um, and when we talk about a single market, one would say that it's complete if we also have a single market tool meaning a protection of uh, intellectual property which uh, covers the whole union and provides a kind of one-stop shop. Um, and different, and in contrast to other areas, for example, in the trademark area, this is not the case uh, in the patent area. And, um, and this is also in uh, very clear contrast to other world areas. Um, world economies uh, like the US, China and others where with a similar number of, of companies and, and uh, inhabitants um, there is a one-stop shop, a full territory protection and a single specialized jurisdiction which <clears throat> up to now and up to the uh, launch of the, uh, the package uh, is not uh, the case. Now, the project has a long history, and I will, not, uh, um, I will spare you the details of all the different etapes because one could do a full speech of that. 
um, with first drafts uh, starting already in the 60s, several conferences and conventions in the 70s, 80s. Uh, first commission uh, starting point, so to speak, in 2000. Um, the Court of Justice uh, speaking about earlier projects and then, um, as you all know, the adoption of the final uh, regulations on the, under the enhanced cooperation in December 2012. Um, the reasons why it took so long um, are many. They are political, uh, mainly related to language questions, um, but they're also legal, turning around the legal basis, but also in particular about um, establishing a court system which uh, fits in the overall um, EU um, judicial order. Now, um, again, this is just to say there has been a long, project, uh, long process behind this. It is not like maybe in some other areas, uh, a quick shot from Brussels. Um, this is a long way um, with always the same objective to provide a, a union-wide, a unitary, a real European um, IP protection in the petted area. And finally, um, this is where we are. Um, I think you're all, <coughs> all aware this uh, system has well, two or three pillars. Um, one pillar which is uh, rooted in union law under enhanced cooperation, regulations uh, about uh, creating the unitary patent protection. And then secondly, the second pillar, uh, the jurisdictional pillar, which is based on an international agreement, an inter intergovernmental agreement. Um, and this is already one of the interesting features of the prototype, um, as I explained. Now we also heard this is um, a toolkit approach, which means the new system is an option. It's an option which stands uh, in parallel uh, next to the national patents and the classical European patent as it is today um, granted by the EPO and then uh, has to be validated differently in uh, the different member states. And equally um, has to be pursued and enforced uh, before the courts in uh, the different member states. And the patent package offers the alternative um, which provides for uniform protection in the participating member states, a one-stop shop procedure for its registration and a unified jurisdiction. So you see, um, we, we follow the concept also that we have in other areas of IP, like in the trademark system, where we have two uh, systems in parallel because still we believe there's no one size fits all. Um, and also, if you have different options, this is healthy competition and means that um, every system has to be designed to attract um, uh, sort of the users. Now I think I also can be short about how it functions. The uh, grant system relies on uh, uh, the process in the EPO. Um, so the grant procedure is uh, kind of delegated to, to the EPO. And in the end of the grant of a classic European patent, um, the unitary effect can be asked for. And the big difference you see at the end of the slide, um, the classic European patent has then to be uh, validated in all in the designated member states, and in the end is a bundle of national patents, whereas the unitary patent has with one act an effect in, uh, in all participating uh, states. Now, I mentioned that uh, the big, one of the big issues uh, of discussion over the whole uh, last uh, many, many years was related to, to language uh, arra arrangements. Um, the regime found here is um, um, tries to, str to strike a balance. It's a, it's a difficult balance. Um, applications can be filed in all languages, but the EPO uh, and the grant procedure works in one of the three languages, English, French, uh, or Germans, and the claims have to be translated. Um, and also during a transitional period, uh, additional translations are um, um, one additional translation is, uh, is required. There is a system of reimbursement of translation costs, in particular for SMEs uh, and non-profit organizations, universities, uh, um, and the like. 
to um, precisely address the biggest issue and cost element of, uh, of the previous system, um, which is the validation and meaning the translation into, into many, many different uh, member states and their languages. There's also a project ongoing on high quality machine translations. Now, often when we talk machine translations, people think Google Translator uh, and believe that, well, what comes out of this uh, is gobbledygook in the end. Um, here we're talking about a specialized uh, system which can rely on the number of, of patterns already available and very specialized in the terminology in this, in this area. Um, the enforcement and litigation system is, of course, a very important pillar of the system. Um, and that's why also uh, many of the discussions circled exactly around the court system. Um, the solution found establishes a centralized, specialized, and highly qualified jurisdiction, um, which at the same time is close to the member states through the possibility to establish local divisions in member states. Um, this, of course, raises questions of a coherence of jurisprudence, which is addressed once where the fact that the judge is working in this jurisdiction will form a pool, um, and therefore there will be a, a huge interaction between all the, the people working in this system, and there is a second instance, which can bring different strings together uh, in appeal proceedings if, if necessary. Um, one of the big questions also in the past circled around the relation and the insertion of the judicial system into the EU system and the relationship to the court. Um, this uh, unified patent court has to be understood as a court of the member states, which therefore has the same obligations um, within the EU system like any, any national court. Um, the system also provides for a number of transitional periods and, and opt-outs, transitions during which uh, still national courts can be seized with, uh, with um, um, patent courts, uh, patent um, uh, litigation, opt-outs, choices for, uh, for companies whether they actually want to, to bring in their uh, European patents into, into the system to allow a flexibility in the startup phase. Now, this is just the organizational structure. Um, I think we can move on to, um, let's say, the, the real yeah, challenges, as it was uh, meant in, my, uh, in the title of my presentation, um, and the potential I will not forget at the end. Um, I said this is an innovative uh, prototype. Um, and the interesting features, these are just some of them. It's a combination of union law and intergovernmental agreement. Um, nevertheless, the two are interlinked through the territorial scope questions, the entry into force. We have an international organization which is entrusted with the implementation um, of, uh, of this uh, union law and the combination with, uh, with the agreement. Mm, and I think it's also uh, an interesting feature that the substantive patent law uh, today is still only very partially harmonized uh, in the union level. So, so far it's essentially in the, for example, in the, in the biotech uh, area where we have a, have a directive which is harmonizing um, this, uh, this area, but not overall. Now, what are the, the challenges ahead and how how do we see it panning out further? And I will give you um, some of the general parts, but also a bit of an insight of, of the discussions we have in the different preparatory uh, bodies. Um, if I maybe start with the, when we talk about the implementation, the role of the EPO. Um, now, one point that came up very early in the discussion is, well, the EPO and the European Patent Organization has more members than the European Union members. Now, the work on the unitary patent is run uh, in a select committee, a, a smaller committee within the organization. But of course, the question is how can we integrate this with the other members of, of the EPO? Then one of the most important, I would say, 
both political but also practical questions that has to be solved in this uh, fora is the question of uh, the price tag for a unitary patent. It's about the renewal fees um, because logically, among other features, this will be a determining factor. Um, there are some orientations in, uh, in the legal texts um, which make clear that this is uh, meant to be set to be useful and practicable for, for the users and not only as a source of income for, um, for patent offices. Um, and I think this is exactly the direction and the advocacy that we are going to make uh, here at the, at the European Commission level to say that this has to uh, really um, work for business. We have some technical questions around the scope in the interim phase. Uh, one very interesting question also is the relation to supplementary protection certificates which uh, relate uh, to the pharma area um, in unitary patents. When we talk about the court, um, I think apart from questions of organizing the preparatory work, which didn't really have a frame, um, one important area are the rules of procedure. And here, questions, two main questions, bifurcation, so split between infringement and validity cases, and secondly, um, injunctions, which are very powerful too. But apart from that, also how to bring a good European course of patent judges together. Um, but this process is already well underway. You saw uh, maybe a publication already of a call for interest. Now, many people say, well, this unified uh, jurisdiction is a powerful tool. It's actually a scary tool. Because if your patent is invalidated here, it falls for the whole union. That's true. But that's, of course, the collateral and the counter side of the big advantage that you don't have to go through 20, 25, or whatever jurisdictions, which might all come to a different conclusion as to whether your patent is valid or not. So I think many of the sort of risks and, uh, and, and um, threats in this system, um, one can always see from both sides. Indeed, as I said, this is a powerful jurisdiction. But precisely, it gives a very powerful and a useful tool which creates massive cost savings for, for those who want to use patents and who want to enforce patents. And I think this is um, the one message that I would like to, you to take away, which starts from the beginning. This is not the best system, but it's the system that we have. And that's why I think the last question that Professor Ulrich mentioned, like, oh, do we have alternatives? I think we can think about this, but this is not the question which is on the table today. Because this is the system we have, no other. And we are happy that we have it because it took us 50 and more years to get to unitary patent protection. So I think now it's the time to look ahead and see how can we make this work. We believe we can make it work. Um, and then, like, many, many other projects in the union. We start from something which is not perfect, and we move on, and it will grow better. Yeah, we started with a small union, and now we have 28. Um, and now we have a system which has its flaws, but it also has its huge advantages, and we're getting there. Because what this is all about, it has a huge potential for establishing a competitive patent protection system in Europe, and to contribute through innovation to growth. And here I would like to close with pointing you to uh, next Monday when the Commission, together with the EPO and um, the uh, uh, OHIM, the Trademark Office in Alicante, will present a study, a study the results of a study on uh, IP-intense industries and their contribution to the economy in Europe. And here and now um, I'm speaking off the record because I'm normally not allowed to already reveal some of the core figures of this. But I can tell you that um, more than 40% or around 40% of the EU economy actually relies on IP intense industries, 25% of all the employment that we have, and um, that the quality of the jobs in this area are also higher than the average. So the detailed figures to follow on Monday, um, but I think this should be our objective and this is the objective behind this project. Thank you.